Hello and welcome to the Extremist Publishing Podcast. I'm Tom Christie. Today's topic is going to be Scotland's cultural heritage, and I'm delighted to be joined by Mr Jim Bennett, who is the CEO of the Bannockburn House Trust. Now, those of you who have not been to Bannockburn House, you're in for a treat because it's not only one of the most significant stately homes in the Stirlingshire area, but one of the most culturally significant in the whole of Scotland. So it's an absolute pleasure to be joined with you today, Jim, uh, to discuss it in more detail. Thank you. So why would you say people should come to Bannockburn House? I know it is a place that has wonderful uh, historical connections and a very long cultural history, but what is it specifically that you would recommend people should uh, come along to see? I think it's important to note that uh, Bannockburn House and the Bannockburn House Estate is located at the crossroads of Scottish history. Uh, it's just a few miles south of Stirling, Stirling City Centre, uh, and really there's 2,000 years of Scottish history immersed in it. And I think it's been well known that anybody who's invaded, visited, uh, or otherwise came to Scotland has probably traversed over the estate. Started off about uh, 2,000 years ago. There's evidence of uh, the Roman armies which came, had a major fort up in Braco. Uh, that marched through the Bannockburn House estate. Should have said that there's the evidence of a Roman road through the estate as well. The Vikings invaded and uh, it was documented that they were on the estate. Uh, the estate was first noted uh, as being part of the Drummond clan, the Drummond family, immediately after the Battle of Bannockburn. Actually, the Battle of Bannockburn, uh, part of it, the Bloody Falls, was fought uh, in the Bannockburn House estate. And that's where what was called the small folk, uh, the wee people, the ordinary people of Bannockburn, the surrounding areas, got involved in the after battle where they uh, chased the English knives with all their kitchen equipment. Uh, and got involved in the slaughter in uh, our uh, our woodlands uh, just again south uh, at the south part of the estate. It was also part of the site of what is almost a, a Game of Thrones epic, uh, where who became James, who became James the Fourth of Scotland, uh, killed his father, who was James the Third of Scotland, uh, reputedly during the Battle of Sockyburn. So that's part of our estate. So even before. Uh, the building of Bannockburn House itself, the estate was extremely well known in Scotland uh, as being part of the, the microcosm of Scottish history. Uh, prior to Bannockburn House, uh, there was a, a, an ancient building there called uh, Drummond Hall, and that was owned by the Drummond family, uh, who were given uh, a lease uh, over the estate by Mary Queen of Scots in the 16th century. Uh, the Grand House itself, the original Jacobean House, uh, was built in 1675 by one of Scotland's most politically connected people, Hugh Patterson. There's a number of Hugh Pattersons uh, in the lineage, uh, but uh, Hugh Patterson also at the same time was connected in with uh, Charles II, and when Holyrood Palace uh, it was redecorated by uh, an English and Dutch plasterer. The English and Dutch plasterer also came to Bannockburn House and created the really European level significant plaster work that's in the Lake Hall uh, and what we call the Blue Room. So uh, even getting to the 17th century, the place is immersed in history. Uh, Later on, it became the centre of tartan manufacture. The owners of uh, Bannockburn's tartan industry, which dominated the tartan industry ac across Scotland, uh, were based at Bannockburn House. My favourite owner, though, was in the 1930s. He was an impresario called A.E. E. Picard. Uh, A.E. E. Picard, I think, was a mixture of a, a Del Boy character and probably a bit of Boris Johnson thrown in. Uh, larger than life, owned the Glasgow Theatre, the Panopticon, uh, and was really a ducker and diver. Now, the favourite thing I like about A.E. E. Picard's tenure at Bannockburn House was the fact that he was Laurel and Hardy's UK agent. So basically from medieval battles, from Game of Thrones like uh, kings, princes slaughtering kings, to Romans marching over the site, uh, Bannockburn House has got it all. And actually I probably missed out the most important element for a lot of people and that's its Jacobite history. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, used Bannockburn House as his headquarters 
both in 1745 and 1746. Uh, and when he fought at the Battle of Falkirk, uh, the Bannockburn Bannock House was where he was, was uh, where he resided. Uh, and there was an assassination attempt made on his life at Bannockburn House as well. So, uh, frankly, the house in private ownership uh, right up to six years ago uh, was taken over by the community uh, to be conserved and used as an asset by the community for the future. So, as you rightly say, Bonnie Prince Charlie was one of perhaps the most famous of the many, many uh, different well-known characters to have stayed at Bannockburn House. But do we know where he stayed in the house? Uh, we do. There, there's two main rooms. The one we call the Blue Room, which was also called the, the State Room, is probably the likely room that he stayed in. Uh, the reason I say that is, is it's the most decorated, very significant plaster work in it. However... Uh, the room that he's reputed to have stayed in, rather than the room that, that would be the, the kind of obvious one that he should have stayed in, we call, surprisingly enough, the Charlie Room. Now, what's interesting about his tenure uh, at Bannockburn House uh, was that's where uh, he met one of the great loves of his life, Clementina Walkinshaw. Clementina Walkinshaw, I think, was the niece uh, of the owner. And when uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie fell ill, she was brought in to nurse him, uh, and the nursing developed into something more serious. Unfortunately, uh, their relationship over the years was quite checkered. Uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie, after he left uh, Scotland uh, to go to live on the continent, bec became quite a, a serious drinker uh, and the, he deprived Clementina Walkinshaw of quite a serious amount of money of support and was, was reputed to have been uh, involved in quite serious domestic violence against her as well. So much so that their joint child, uh, it took decades for him to recognise that that child was actually his. So he uh, it wasn't all, as far as Bonnie Prince Charlie was concerned, it wasn't all shortbread tins and uh, uh, nice myths and legends. But um, I'm sure I'll have a lot of our uh, Jacobite reenactors not very happy about me saying this. So you mentioned the incredible interior of Bannockburn House, the plaster work and the uh, period decorative features. Um, that, these are things that really do help the place stand out, don't they? Yep. Amongst other uh, houses of the same vintage. Yeah. I mean, when you walk in, there's a, a Victorian extension uh, uh, out, as, uh, out towards the entrance hall. When people originally would have walked in, then they would have walked in directly to what was called the Lake Hall. Uh, and the Lake Hall, as soon as you walk into Bannockburn House, uh, you'll see this uh, absolutely marvellous plaster work, really intricate really or ornate plaster work uh, commissioned by Hugh Patterson during the reign of Charles II and if you visit Holyrood Palace uh, you'll see the similarities between uh, what the uh, Dutch and English artisans made in terms of plaster work there really significant plaster work uh, significant on a European level what you had was a uh, journeying artisans. Uh, they would have made their way from palace to palace across Europe. Uh, and when Hugh Patterson, who was, as I said, very well politically connected at the time, visited Holyrood Palace and saw these, saw these artisans uh, working on the uh, working on the plaster work for Holyrood Palace, uh, he he poached them to come and work in Bannockburn House. Uh, there's a small example, smaller example of the Lake Hall plaster work in what we call the Blue Room or the State Room, uh, and it, it's really rather lovely. What's interesting for the community, though, is uh, the discussion that there has to be about the uh, uh, repair uh, of the plaster and making sure that it's properly conserved so that even when we completely uh, restore the building, uh, the heating in the building will never be allowed to go above 16 degrees uh, because the plaster work shouldn't be dried out. So we take a lot of advice uh, on the the restoration, the maintenance and the repair of all the issues of the building from historic environment Scotland. And of course, uh, we're privileged in Stirling to have uh, HES, as they're called, to have their uh, headquarters of their workshops based here. So we get a lot of informal advice and support as well as uh, receiving their uh, both masters and apprentice trainees. Yeah, because as you say, since the Bannockburn House has passed into the 
care of the community. Um, really amazing things have been done by the volunteers to bring it to life, haven't they? Hasn't that been the case? Uh, it was a very significant experience. I mean, several hundred years of private ownership. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the ownership since the 1940s, uh, although the family who owned uh, the buildings from the 40s up to the, the, the 60s or early 70s was asset rich. They were, they were cash poor. Uh, I think we've heard that a, a lot from significant estates. So, so the estate started to fall into disrepair. Eventually, there was only one member of that family. Most of the contents of the house were sold in the 1960s, and then the house itself was sold in the 70s. But the person who bought it, who lived in uh, Merseyside, never actually lived in it. Uh, there were a couple of caretakers lived in it, but there was no real running water, no electricity. And when the community took over, Around five years ago, there was a one-year campaign for the community to take it over. But about five years ago, uh, really, there was six feet high brambles, the the four foot high holly hedges that there had been in the beautiful manicured gardens in the nineteen forties had turned into forty to fifty foot high hedges. So, uh, Margaret, our head gardener often says that the first two or three years of community ownership wasn't about gardening, uh, but it was about estate clearance work. It was about bramble clearance, about rhododendron clearance. And it's only over o only over the past uh, two to three years that we've really developed uh, a, a, a rejuvenation and uh, using the 200 volunteers that we've got to build path networks, to develop, redevelop formal ja Jacobean gardens. Uh, and to develop a real access for local people into the buildings and estate. And of course, one of the great benefits of Bannockburn House coming back to life in these last few years has been the fact that it's been the location of filming for TV and I think Ghost Hunters as well, is that right? Yeah, we've had actually the most recent uh, film location deal and I'll just say a bit about why these film location deals are important to us. Uh, the local community doesn't receive any core funding to operate the house. So we've uh, got a cocktail of grants that we've accessed, but we also have to make our own trading income. Uh, so our own trading income, part of that has been quite successfully uh, letting the premises out to uh, photography workshops, but also as a film location. And film location location deals are great because I've got two weeks of film location it's really decent serious money and we've had everything from Channel 5 uh, films, ITV films, uh, a Netflix film uh, uh, as well as a number of independent film producers using as a, as a location uh, and, and it's, it's excellent money but we couldn't buy the publicity frankly that these film locations give us I mean, to me, I've watched uh, and quite a number of these films uh, and I lose track entirely of the storyline because I'm I'm thinking, oh, that's the third floor, oh, that's the blue room. Well, that, that's, we don't have that there, you know, because they've edited in a pond or, you know, a, a location from somewhere else into it. Uh, but also the house itself, we've managed to, uh, in terms of the staging for the films uh, and the decoration budgets that they've got, we've managed to rejuvenate quite a number of areas just through that. You mentioned about ghost hunters. I think there's been a, a wee bit of controversy around the Bannockburn community about the ghost hunters, but it is uh, it is quite a, a decent money earner for us, frankly. So every penny that we get for that is put into conserving the building. But the latest that we had was a, a team of Swedish TV ghost hunters. Uh, you know, they run a, a, a sort of 11.30 at night programme where they investigate ghosts in a whole number of different stately homes across Europe. Uh, so we had a couple of day, uh, days filming uh, from these ghost hunters from Sweden. Uh, but we've also had them uh, from, uh, you know, these you know, sort of channel 37s that you would tune in at two or three o'clock in the morning because you can't see. There's been some very funny aspects that, that, that has our volunteers rolling about laughing because one of the uh, ghost hunter programmes that we had was somebody very quietly talking about the feeling of demons coming in from the forest and the, the camera pans out towards the woodland, uh, you know, encroaching towards the house and all you see is 
you know, the demon's eyes lighting up. Of course, the Bannockburn people who know it well are rolling about laughing because they know it's the herd of deer that we've got that roam. You know, it's the, it's the lights flashing in the deer's eyes, but uh, it makes for good television. We had, uh, unfortunately, he's passed on now, but we had a, a caretaker when we first took over the place. Uh, and he looked after it at night, but uh, he he used to hide in cupboards when we had gross ghost hunting crews going about. And when the ghost hunting crew was nearby, he would start scratching the inside of the door uh, of the cupboard that he was in, just to just to add to the atmosphere of him. But uh, don't tell everybody about that. I'm sure we do have real ghosts. Now, another reason why Bannockburn House has become such a popular venue, not just locally but and further afield is the number of lectures and presentations and different events that you have. Uh, what kind of events do you have coming up in the coming year? Uh, well, uh, the, I'll talk about some of the events that we've had and some of the, the past stuff that we've had first and, and then come on to uh, the coming year. Uh, one, we, we regularly had uh, open community events where we had the Jacobite reenactors, the various groups uh, coming along uh, and demonstrating some of the some of the clothing, uh, you know, some of the weaponry, everything like that for uh, the uh, the Jacobite wars. But that was cut across by the pandemic and the lockdown. But uh, Ross, our events manager, very quickly turned these events. Uh, into online experience and working closely with the Stirling, Stirling Council archaeologist, Dr Murray Cook, who I think you've probably heard on previous podcasts. Yeah, long, a long time friend of the podcast, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, anybody who knows Murray Cook will know he's a, an ebullient character who probably would have been a great friend to A. E. Pickard if they lived in the, uh, in, in the same period. And we worked with Murray uh, during, or rather Ross, uh, worked with Murray uh, during the pandemic period to put on uh, weekly historical lectures, both about Bannockburn House, but also about Stirling local history. We operated these through, uh, you know, the online platform Zoom. Uh, and we webcast these out on YouTube at the same time. So regularly we were getting uh, complete sellouts, you know, 100 people at a time on Zoom uh, and then getting several thousand views. I think actually over the pandemic period we had something like 142,000 views uh, of all the lecture series that we put out. I think there was about 26 lectures uh, over the pandemic uh, and we had a whole number of uh, online events. Now, uh, that was extremely good and uh, and these are all still available on YouTube and on our website, uh, bannockburnhouse.scot. Sorry, actually, they're probably more likely to be on their Facebook page, uh, which is the Bannockburn House page. Uh, there's two, there's Bannockburn House community group, but the Bannockburn House page has the uh, all the videos in it, so you're very welcome to, to look there. Uh, that will also give details of the other events we've had. It's a fantastic fantastic venue for photography. Uh, so we have uh, one of the really significant events that we had uh, was we had an uh, amateur photographer, Mark Leslie, uh, works as a care worker, but is inspired by fine art approaches to photography. And he photographed about 60 volunteers, all dressed in period costume, uh, using the house as a backdrop. Uh, they cut, that project culminated in using the Grand Lake Hall for an exhibition of the portraits that he'd made of volunteers. Now, we had hundreds and hundreds of people attending that. Now, what Mark Leslie said was, portraits in Grand Halls are usually for princes, lords, kings and queens. And we talk about the Hugh Partons and the Bonnie Prince Charlies and Clementina Walkinshaws, who are all part of nobility. The difference uh, that was made during that uh, during that photography exhibition that we had is massive four foot by six foot uh, portraits of ordinary Bannockburn people, you know, up dressed in the grandest clothes in the grandest style uh, with all their relatives and local community coming to see it with hundreds and people, hundreds of people flooding in. And that goes to the ethos that we're trying to create is that ownership and control leadership by by local people for local people uh, and really conserving a European classic stately home 
uh, but curated by the local people of Bannockburn and the eastern Stirling villages. Well, it would be remiss of me not to ask, given how much incredible work has been happening at Bannockburn House, uh, where you would like to see it go in the future, if there's any particular ambitions that you, you have for uh, the long term of the project. I think it's very important that you've touched on that. One of the early things uh, that the local community did was commission a master plan. Uh, the master plan was developed by conservation architects Simpson and Brown. They're one of the two leading conservation architects firms in Scotland. And what the master plan does is map out over a 10 to 15 year period about the developments that need to happen uh, both within the house but within the estate as a whole as well. We want to make this a, a destination venue for all of Scotland to be able to extend people's stays in Stirling so that we make a, an offer alongside the Stirling Castle and the Wallace Monument and the other key offers that there are in Stirling, that Bannockburn House becomes part of that so that when people visit Stirling, it's not just for a day, it's for two or three days where they can visit uh, Scotland's history and microcosm. So the master plan it has about 20 to 30 individual projects all related towards conservation and development. They include things as uh, kind of prosaic as developing a car park, which is our next big capital development uh, happening uh, from April onwards, uh, to rejuvenation of the gardens, to conservation of the plasterwork ceilings, uh, and uh, uh, again, mundanely, you know, spending several hundred thousand pounds on uh, gutters, roofs, uh, drainage, things like that. I mean, when we started uh, the work, uh, we had to do things as basic as ensuring there was an up-to-date electrical supply in the house, developing the water supply in the house. We had a group of volunteers uh, rebuilding toilets. We existed for two years in temporary toilets that cost, I think, about £300 a month to hire. They're very expensive, but... Uh, we raised the money and used volunteer labour uh, to be able to rebuild uh, the old chicken sheds outside and uh, what are quite beautiful toilets. So everything from toilets to car parks to water supply to electrical supply to uh, fire alarm systems, burglar systems, you know, all, the, all of this sort of stuff we've had to put in, uh, as well as, you know, developing the long-term care and conservation of the house. So we have, in the master plan, we have a whole range of projects uh, which are uh, detailed, timelined, uh, costed out, and we're just waiting for the right uh, grants to come up so that we make a pitch for them. Well, Jim, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us today about really one of the most amazing places that you will see in Stirlingshire. Um, I would recommend anyone who's coming to visit Central Scotland to take the time to visit Bannockburn House, have a look at the website, see the many different events and activities that are taking place there. And if nothing else, if anyone ever asks you what connects Bonnie Prince Charlie and Laurel and Hardy the next time you have a pub quiz, you'll know the answer. Thanks so much, Jim. Thank you. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode and that you'll come and join us again soon. If you would like to find out more about advertising on the Extremist Publishing Podcast, please visit their website at www.extremistpublishing.com for details.